What's up, everybody? Welcome to this live review of the Atlantic Technology 8600 ELR tower speakers and EC, which is the center channel. Um, doing this one live, and actually, I wasn't even going to do this one initially, got to be honest, because I thought I did a pretty good job, not like in a bragging way. I just thought I did. A, how do you say this without sounding like you're saying something else? I wrote a lot of stuff in the online review and I didn't really feel like there was anything that was left that was needed to be said about these speakers. And quite frankly, if I'm being honest, I really just wasn't terribly fond of them. I've got a lot of other things that I would rather put time into, but I did have uh, maybe a handful of folks who asked me if I would be willing to do a video review for those speakers. So that's what I'm going to do here today. Um, few things first. I got these speakers from the company directly. So they came directly from Atlantic Technologies. I also worked with AVS Forum on this as kind of a um a collaboration, but I was not paid. And AVS Forum, the the editor staff, uh John Atkinson, John Atkinson, John, sorry, Jacob Atkinson. Uh, did not see this review. He was the one who actually reached out to me to see if I would be willing to come and work for them. Uh, so I'm not paid for this review. I'm not getting any kickback, nothing. It Basically, what happened was I was contacted to see if I would be willing to review. I said, yes, but I don't want to get paid, which I know sounds stupid to some of you, but there's reasons for me for doing that. Uh, then the speakers came, I believe. Did they come from John? No, they came from Atlantic Technology directly to my house. I took them upstairs. Now, each speaker, tower, and center channel is around 90 pounds, give or take. I took each speaker upstairs to my home theater, and I've got a video on that. If you haven't seen it, I'll try to remember to put it in the description link below, but if not, just check my channel. There's a DIY home theater tour that I posted maybe a couple months ago. I took them up there. I did all my listening first. Then I took them back down. I did all of my testing, and then I evaluated the results, kind of compared them with my notes. Then took them back upstairs, and based on the measurements, I applied some equalization to the speakers to try to see what would work and what wouldn't work, and basically to verify some of what the data was telling me. And that's the way I always do my reviews. I have specific reasons for that. I don't really doesn't really matter, uh, not for this interview, but that's kind of my process of things. So, kind of wanted to get that out of the way up front. And what we'll do is we will go ahead and jump into the review. Now, the data is not posted on my website because, again, this was in collaboration with AVS Forum. And really, the only upside for me was just the ability to test a speaker that I thought people might be interested in. So if you want to support in any sort of way, I'll throw a couple generic affiliate links below. None of them tie to the Atlantic Technology speakers, but I'll throw like a, an Amazon affiliate link. Um, but audio advice and maybe a Crutchville one. So if there's like any stuff that you need and that you're going to buy anyway, please consider going through those links. And that gets me, you know, like four to 6%, depending on what you get, that helps me out. And that way, you know, you don't have to come out of pocket, but you can still help me to be able to afford things. Yeah. These speakers didn't cost me any money, but it cost me a lot of time, ate up a whole lot of time. And then there's a lot of money that I spend on the backside doing other reviews. So I'll just kind of putting that out there. All right. Now all that stuff is laid down. Let me pull this up on the screen over here, and I'm just going to kind of go through this review. I'm, I'm going to try to go through it somewhat quickly. I'm not going to stop and read every single paragraph. I'm going to touch on what I feel are the highlights based on uh, my audible memory, and th thankfully, I have some of these written down in notes. And then kind of just depending on what we have done for, or what I sh should say, what we have in our chat, if there are any questions about the data or anything like that, then I will answer those and then we'll split and you guys can have a enjoyable rest of your Saturday evening. So with that said, let's go ahead and start rolling through. Now, these speakers are pretty tall. The tower speakers, as you can see, are. And if you saw the thumbnail, you kind of got an idea. I could actually fit crouching right in this area. So they're a pretty decent sized speaker. Uh, the one thing that I don't like about this speaker is without the extra little spacers, the little footers, the tweeter level is just too low. It was like kind of aimed at my chin. So keep in, keep in mind that you're going to need the, the footers, the little spacer riser things that come 
with the speakers. So yeah, they come with the speakers. I would recommend you use them because I had to go back downstairs, get them and some of the hardware that I needed and then set them up to these speakers. Otherwise they were just too low. Uh, the cool thing is you see that you've got a very symmetrical vertically speaking pattern here. So you've got two midwoofers. I think these are eight inch, but honestly, I don't recall. Uh, I think these are five inch mid ranges. And then you've got your one inch dome tweeter. There is no waveguide. So it's just a dome tweeter on a flat baffle. There is a little bit of a curvature uh, or maybe I guess a beveled edge is, is more the better word on the side of the tower speakers. And then the same thing goes for the center channel. So I think the center channel though is six inch mid woofers right here and then five inch and then a, a dome tweeter as well. Uh, if you wanna check the sizes, you can do that on their website. I think most of you know by now that I don't give you all the specs because anybody can look that stuff up and I'm trying to get to the stuff that I feel really matters. If you're already looking at the speaker, then odds are you don't care if it's a six or eight inch woofer. You're, you've already figured that out, right? You just want to know, hey, is it any good? And hopefully that's what I'm going to be able to help you with. Okay, so scrolling down on the back, give me a second. There are the uh, multi-way binding posts, so you can bi-amplify these speakers if you want to. Side note, I don't know that bi-amplifying does anything, honestly. It might, if you have larger speakers, that's kind of just the common theme or common thought in the audiophile community. But one of these days... I do plan to try to present you with data. I've been collecting stuff in the background uh, for like the last year. And basically all it takes, if, you, if you're going to take the stance that by amplifying matters or doesn't, if you're going to pick one of those sides, then it's so easy to prove that it does if you can show any difference one time. That's all it takes. So that's the thing I hate about these, these little kind of gotcha phrases. You know, you, this matters or it doesn't. As soon as you see a difference one time or as soon as somebody can prove that you heard a difference one time, that's all it takes. And then the whole, it doesn't, it's thrown out the window. But I try to do more than just it does or it doesn't. I try to provide some kind of context to each of those things. Um, going further, we can see that there's a high frequency energy switch on the back. Now, average is how I measured this speaker in full. Uh, location, normal. Boundary compensation, normal. That's how the speaker was measured for both of them the same way. And then I did do some follow-up testing at the bottom of the review for each of the speakers to show you what effect these have, but I didn't do a full spin. So I just did an on-axis measurement showing the effect of each of these switches. Again, we will get to that later. Excuse me. Uh, by the way, allergies here is crushing our family. My kid is in the other room coughing her head off. So if you hear me take a pause every now and again, just understand that that's me pausing to make sure she's all right. She's been coughing her head off. Uh, it's not going well for her, but she'll be okay. But yeah, it just sucks seeing your kid going through stuff like that. And then me, same thing, man, just drainage galore. I need a good uh, sinus dude or something. Okay, avsforum.com. Let's see here. Any kind of the stuff that I want to note? Yes, all of this testing was done with the Clipple Near Fill Scanner, a state-of-the-art measurement utility that allows us to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment. Why do you care? Because you want to understand and characterize the performance of the speaker before you even put it in a room. And then people naturally say, well, the room messes it up. Well, if that's your stance, then why do you trust anybody that says anything? Why don't you go out and buy all 50 of the speakers that you think are worth it and then try them all out in your room? That's not feasible. And then we come back to the logical side of things where we say, okay, well, let's characterize what we can before we have to go out and buy all these things, narrow it down, and then pick a good selection, maybe. Order them from Audio Advice, it's a cheap plug. Amazon has returns. You can order from somewhere like that that allows you a good return policy. Try it out in your room, and then, hey, send the ones back that you don't like. That's what they're there for. Unfortunately, we don't have the stereo shops of yore. You know, even when I was Coming up in the early thousands, we didn't really have stereo shops. And I'm near the Huntsville, Alabama area. We've never had a legitimate stereo shop other than we had a tweeter. And I think they closed down in 2008, if I recall correctly. Now, if I want to go to a stereo shop, I've got to drive at least two hours. There's a high five buys in Nashville, Tennessee, which I haven't been there in about three years. But the few times that I've stopped in there, great folks to deal with. And then the other side of things is I have to go to Atlanta. Now that's about three to four hours, depending on traffic. So yeah, I'm sure a lot of you out there, especially if you're in the more rural parts of America, 
feel my pain. And that's really why having data is so great because you can kind of help understand the performance of a speaker before you drop a lot of money and make that purchase decision. You can kind of narrow them down. Uh, to keep going, if you don't know what this channel is about, if this is your first venture into this, hopefully you've kind of got a good grasp on what I'm about here by, based on everything I've already said. Uh, but if you still don't know, basically I, what I do is I provide objective data, subjective thoughts for my listening tests. I try to correlate the two and I try to help us understand, uh, again, the performance of the speaker. So if you're interested, I do have other videos. You can check my YouTube page here. You can check my website, aaronsautocorner.com, and you can get a feel for some of the things that I've tested and measured everything from $90 bookshelf speakers to $17,000 pro audio monitors. Uh, I try to test a little bit of everything because I think it's cool to understand the low end and the high end. And there's a lot of people out there that can afford both. I'm much more on the lower end, but I still think it's cool to understand what you get when you pay a lot of money. Sometimes you don't get much. Sometimes you get really cool stuff. So, With that said, uh, I use the Parasound Hint 6 as my amplification. I use Oppo Blu-ray Player BDP-103. And... Uh, what else did I do? Apple TV. So a lot of different things. I listen to music and I listen to movies over the span of about two weeks. And that's what my subjective takes are built upon. And I'll see if I can blow this up any better. That did not work. Okay. All the speaker measurements were taken in reference at the Twitter level. They were all listened at the Twitter level. That's the best spot for these speakers. You can go above or below that. We're going to talk about that in the data. None of them were listened to with the grill on because the grill is very big and bulky. And typically, and this speaker kind of holds true of that too, the grill makes things even worse. And I will say that the grill was crazy hard to get off of the speaker. I'm dead serious. There was a fellow who loaned me the JBL 4367s. I believe he saw me trying to show him like, dude, these things are hard to get off. So you don't have to worry about the grills coming off. They are fully magnetic. And when they are on, you really have to force them off. Okay. Uh, price, $6,100 a pair for the towers, $2,500 for the single. That's as of this review. Now, this may change. I don't know, but as of this review. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the impedance. The impedance uh, does some things. It bounces around, does some things. I'm just going to start saying that for everything. What I mean to say is it does dip down into the, what, the 2.9 ohm region. I've since updated my graphs, so um, I'll, I'll have a better understanding, or not better understanding, but a better way of presenting impedance going forward in my other reviews. But for now, this will have to do. Basically, you're going to want a separate amplifier. And the reason I say that is because it stays below 4 ohm the majority of the time. And then it also has a phase rotation round through here, where it's already down low. So that phase rotation is going to drop this uh, actual impedance or the load on your amplifier, so it's gonna make it a little bit harder to drive. So a standard AVR or something of that nature is not gonna work for this speaker. I will also say that the cool thing is that I don't see any resonance signs in the impedance. Normally, when you have resonance from a speaker, you can see it very clearly in the impedance, and I'm not seeing any of that here, so that's a good sign. Let's keep going. All right, we have the spin data, the on-axis response, and then the off-axis combination responses. Uh, the on-axis, we see a little bit of a bump in this, eh, the mid, mid-range area, three to about maybe 600 hertz or so. It's going to give it a little bit more, not boom, but maybe a little bit more chest in certain vocals. Uh, I didn't really have a problem with that so much. What I heard was the higher frequencies. And you may be thinking, well, the high frequencies don't look terrible. Actually, what looks bad is this dip right here. Well, because when you are putting these speakers into the room, you're not hearing just the on-axis response. You're hearing the off-axis response too. All the sounds are reflected off the walls. And that results in a response that is quite different than just the on-axis response. And we're going to see that. But what I want to touch on right now is down here. The early, reflective, the early reflections directivity index. So this is a comparison of the early reflections. So the, sound, the sounds that hit the sod walls first and then come to you, the floor and the ceiling, and then come to you. There's basically like the frontal hemisphere of the speaker with a little bit of the back compared to a listening window. Now the listening window is plus or minus 10 degrees vertically, plus or minus 30 degrees off to the side of the speaker. 
Ideally, you want all of these to kind of track the same. And when they don't, that's a sign that there's going to be problems with the sound of the speaker when it gets in your room. Some things you can equalize out, but when the ERDI, this dash blue line down here, is not linear. And let me take a second to explain what I mean about that. Linear line, right? It doesn't mean inherently flat. It doesn't mean inherently sloped. It just means linear, okay? So that could mean that it could be flat or it could be sloped, but it doesn't have to be one or the other. The shape of that line or, or the steepness of that line indicates how directive that speaker is going to be in regards to its sound radiation. If you had a flat line through here, it would be pretty much an omnidirectional speaker at the zero dB line all the way down here. So if we start at 50 and we just drew a flat line, that means the speaker is radiating the exact same way no matter where you turn it or where you stand in relation to the speaker. Uh, if it narrows up, that means that the high frequencies are becoming more directive. And then anything in between. So if it starts to narrow up, as you see here, so the higher frequencies up to about 1.5 kilohertz, becoming more directive. So those woofers are starting to beam a little bit more. Then we dip back down where there's a crossover region. I don't know if that's the, probably the mid range, I'm guessing. And then let's see here, you probably reach into the tweeter area and then you dip back down again. So what this is really telling us is that the radiation pattern isn't very consistent as you increase in frequency, it's changing. So it's going, wide, getting narrow, getting narrow, getting wide, getting narrow, getting narrow, getting wide. And you may wonder, what's the implication of that? Well, in my experience, purely anecdotal, uh, the sound stage tends to be more, I, well, maybe less 3D. Uh, the reason I say that is because some frequencies and their harmonics are at different places in the sound stage. Uh, the other thing, too, is that the more directional speaker is. So if this was a straight line all the way up through here, like linear sloped, I guess I should say, going all the way up through here, then that would mean that the high frequencies are less reflective in the room than the lower frequencies. And if it were flat through here, then that means all frequencies are radiating the same and they're equally reflective. And then that is when it gets to preference. Do you like a speaker or does your room benefit more from a speaker that is highly directional, where there's less sound being reflected off the walls, or do you prefer or does your room also benefit from a speaker that has more reflections off the walls? Personally speaking, I think I'm kind of getting to that point where I find that mid-range, I prefer it to be wider, and I don't mind a sloping directivity index, so an increasing line through here in the higher frequencies but it also depends on the shape of your on axis and your listening window. So there's a lot of little caveats in this data. And to be honest with you, it can be confusing, but I promise you, if you stick around long enough and you ask the questions that you're curious about, then you'll understand it a lot more quickly and it will truly benefit you in a way that you probably wouldn't have thought before. And that's why I say, give the data a chance, okay? All right, uh, let's keep going through here. Let's see, did I make any notes about through this stuff? Uh, relative, oh, I talked about the mean sensitivity, which is around, let's see, did I mention this, 91 dB. And that is based on 300 Hertz to three kilohertz. So really what's hurting that average sensitivity causing it to come down is this droop and response in the upper mid range response area to the high frequency handoff area. Otherwise you'd be looking at about 92, maybe 93, somewhere in that area. So it's good sensitivity. Uh, but the thing you're going to notice is that it rolls off, so there's not a lot of bass. Well, that's okay, because it's expected that you're going to use a subwoofer, right? Now, this isn't a full-range, two-channel stereo speaker. It's just not intended to be used that way. And if that's what you're looking for, this is not the speaker for you. But if you have a subwoofer and you are going to use it, then this speaker could be for you. Now, I'll be honest with you, I didn't like the speaker. I can't really recommend it based on what I heard. But people own it. People have said, I like it just fine. And hey, if you like it, that's great. I'm not here to tell you that you can't like what you like. I'm just here to help you make an informed decision. Uh, let's see here. I just talked about all that. Now we're getting to the estimated in-room response. Now this is very important. And this really gives you a good idea of what you can expect to hear in your listening room at the primary listening position. But if you were to go off axis, then obviously this would change. 
Uh, what we see is what matches up to my actual measured in situ response. So I took the microphone, my U mic one, REW, moving mic method, waved it around my face, did all that stuff, and pretty much had the same thing from about 700 hertz and up. Now below that is when the room starts to take, to take over, excuse me, and you have some bass issues, some lower mid range issues, and things like that. But that's very typical of a room. And that's why understanding how to place the speakers correctly, uh, bass traps, proper absorption, diffusion, room treatments in general, and or arrayed subwoofers really starts to help, and equalization. That's another big hitter. Now, this part right here is what I did not like about the speaker. And if I look through here, let's see here. Did I mention anything about this particular speaker? Okay, what I did was I drew a trend line, just to give you an idea of, Generally speaking, you want a speaker that trails off in high frequency. Otherwise, it's going to sound too bright in your room. And I've also experienced that in a number of speakers where this right here is just flat. That's very bright sounding or any deviation from that general trend of the speaker tends to stand out more than you would prefer it to. And it calls attention to itself. And that's really what happened here. This stood out and caused the sound to be, I think I said it was grainy, uh, just very bright and Frankly, it was unbearable. Um, I just I couldn't get along with these speakers at all. I did use equalization, and that trimmed it down some, but I didn't really fully resolve the issues like I thought. And with that in mind, let's go back up and look at the ERDI. But first, let's note something. One kilohertz, two, three, four, five. So you're centered around five kilohertz, okay? Let's go back up here and look at this ERDI. Now, the other thing about this ERDI that I did not mention is that it gives you an idea of how well you can equalize the speaker. Now, the ERDI has some vertical components, and when you have separation between mid-range tweeter, mid-woofers, you're going to have some irregularities in the ERDI, and I can normally separate those out and kind of get a feel for what's caused by the vertical versus what's caused by the horizontal. And a lot of this stuff is caused by the vertical, um, but... The horizontal plane also kind of has some, some things going on around there, and we'll show you that in a little bit. But if I'm just looking at this, what I'm seeing is, yeah, you could probably e EQ out that 5 kilohertz area, but when I did it, it still didn't get rid of the issue as much as I would have liked it to. Uh, what I did actually was I wound up turning the speakers a little bit off axis. So facing, I think it was like 10 or 20 degrees off axis, and then I used equalization centered at that 5 kilohertz with a PEQ, and I just drop that down manually with the mini DSP. You guys don't have a mini DSP and you're into playing around with stuff like this, I highly suggest you buy one. Just get the two channel one. I think they're maybe like 99 bucks or something like that. Um, but yeah, definitely consider getting one of those. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so here we are at the horizontal response. And basically what you're trying to look for here is the dark red and the red are the stronger areas of sound radiation. And then the orange is kind of like a lower level. You can kind of tell that by this key over here. And then as you go trend toward the back of the speaker, you get into this blue and that's at a much lower level. So the higher SPL levels are at the front of the speaker. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, right? Because you're down here at the listening position. Now this is the bird's eye view. So you're looking down at the top of the speaker. The speaker's firing out in this direction down to the zero degrees. But see how this red kind of is broad. It's almost omnidirectional at some frequencies and with this low 200, maybe 300 Hertz or so. And then as you increase to five, six, seven, eight hundred Hertz or so, you are narrowing up. So you're not omnidirectional anymore. Now you're basically the front portion of the speaker. And then as you get out into this 1.3 kilohertz area, now you've gone from about 90 degrees, plus or minus 90 degrees to the side of the speaker to about plus or minus, what is that? 30 to 40 degrees out through here. So it's narrowed up. Okay. That's, that's not the end of the earth. That's, that's fine even, okay? But the problem is that as you go higher in frequency, now you've got some that are kind of hanging out, going a little bit wider. And really what happens is it looks to me like you want to start going wide at around two kilohertz. You've got a null right here for some reason. That's, that's what this looks like to me, at least at first glance. And then, yeah, here's your width right here. And that's in that five kilohertz, eight kilohertz ballpark kind of trending through here. And then it narrows up. Well, all this extra energy is being reflected off the side walls and it's coming back toward you. And that, my friends, is why you end up with this. So 
So you had that strong red that's extending to the outside of that speaker, bouncing off the walls, coming back at you, and you're hearing a lot of this. And then it's diminishing as you go higher in frequency. So if we go back and look again, that's what you're doing. Lower in frequency or lower in amplitude, you know, narrowing up, boom, wide. All this stuff and then narrowing up again, okay? That's what you're hearing in that estimated interim response. That's what you're going to hear in the listening room. And then if we go look at the vertical response, there's a lot of weird little lobing issues going on. That's just crossover between the uh, midwoofer to mid-range mid-range to tweeter. Now, are these an issue? Okay. If you go back and watch some of my previous reviews and even watch my conversation with Floyd Tool, Dr. Tool, um, I think the verdict is maybe not completely in on how much the vertical reflections uh, impact our hearing. But if I'm being honest, I'm starting to see correlations based on my listening notes versus speakers with a more uniform vertical pattern where the ones that have a more uniform vertical pattern have a better, more three-dimensional soundstage. Those tend to show up with concentric designs from KEF and then uh, other DSP type designs where they can control the crossover slope and make it very steep. And then you don't really have these lobe issues going on, but that also weighs into the time alignment aspect. And there's no way for me, just little old me working a full-time job and doing all this other stuff to create a study on time delay step response versus vertical lobing pattern. I just, I don't have the way to separate those two out. Uh, if you know of any research that tells me any of that information that has done that, great. But I am a very firm believer in comparing apples to apples. I think if you, what you were going to do is you would take a bunch of speakers some with vertical lobing patterns like this, some with great lobing patterns, and then have them offset from the tweeter to the mid, mid to the mid woofer, and Tom, and just listen and try to see if you notice a difference. I think that's probably the best way to go about that, but it's not as simple as I'm just going to implement a DSP filter in here and call it a day. Unless you are truly building a speaker from scratch and you are doing it with a DSP filter, then yeah, you can you can kind of have your pick at that. You can use uh, steep slopes, all pass filters, time delay. You can play around with that stuff and do some A-Bing. So if you want to do that, by all means, do that. But uh, the main thing that I'm going to take away from this and, and point out to you all listening is that if you're listening to the tower speaker, zero degrees is the tweeter. You want to stay within plus or minus 10 degrees because as you go above and below that line up to 15 or 20 degrees, you start hearing these suckouts and basically there's no energy at what, two and a half K, uh, one to two K. There's a lot of issues going on in that area. Let's see here. Okay. Now moving on. Let's talk about output. Output is good for these speakers. I'm gonna blow through this section pretty quickly because this is less important to me than the frequency response is. Uh, very low distortion. At 86 dB, you're below 1%, uh, all the way down into 50 hertz. I mean, what is this, like 0.3% or something? I can't remember what negative 50 dB is, but it's very, very low. And then if you go to 96 dB, you're still super duper low. So output-wise, these speakers have no issues. Compression-wise, really, really great performance. I would say no issues there until you get below 80 hertz. But I said earlier, you're going to be using the subwoofer. So that's really a non-issue as well, in my opinion. Um, and then let's go through and kind of look at some of these switches, all right? So the switches on the back, default is just the standard measurement on axis with the tweeter, no switches, or, or I should say they're all set to nominal or default or average or whatever it is by default. But if you go to the reverberant room, you can see that the reverberant room has a little bit less energy in the high frequency. If you flip the damped room switch, you have a little bit more high frequency. Behind the screen, there's a little bit more high frequency. Uh, boundary compensation on, so the difference is going to be down here. Let's see here, default purple, so default is going to be in black, and the purple is boundary compensation on, which means they're just kind of dropping the level a little bit. In other words, if you put it next to a wall, you don't want a lot of bass buildup from that speaker, and it really doesn't need to work as hard, so you can turn that boundary compensation on. It'll drop that level a little bit. And then if I measure with just the grill on axis, 
you can see that the grill really does some funky things, especially at this four to five kilohertz region in green. Look at that. That's crazy, man. I mean, yeah. It definitely seems to bring out more resonances uh, than, man, than, than you would want. Now, ideally, it would be great if I could have measured the speaker fully with the grill on, but that takes like, well, for this particular speaker, I think it was an eight or nine hour measurement. And that's just a lot of time that I wasn't willing to invest. And that's kind of that. Uh, some of my notes at the end, high frequency issues, I know are very problematic, really had an issue with that. You can knock it down some with EQ. Sensitivity being high, compression low, distortion low. Uh, Mid-range scoop needs to be resolved. Let's see, two to three hertz or two to three kilohertz. Yeah, you could EQ that up a little bit. Yeah, and I do remember thinking that the mid-range scoop was, was really off. And what made the sound even worse was that boost around five kilohertz. It was just the combination of those two was, was not good. Okay, so that's it for the tower speaker. Um, let me check my notes over here and get some water. Okay, uh, missed anything so far? Okay, so let's go check out the center channel. And I'm gonna kind of go through this one a little bit more faster because I've given you the 411 on the uh, CEA data and kind of what it means. So again, the center channel, you know, the weird thing is it dips really low down here. You may not need a separate amplifier just looking at this, but uh, I'm willing to bet that the phase is probably gonna skew things up right through here. Actually, I don't know, that's an interesting case. I don't know. Let's just say I would default to a separate amplifier just because. And this speaker does have a little bit lower sensitivity, which we see. Let's see in here. This graphic. So you're at about 88 dB or so. I said 88.4 dB. Uh, noted that the linearity is good until you get to the 1 and 2 kilohertz mid-range area. So there's a little bit of a bump right through there. And then a drop right through here. And I'm thinking that this is probably the crossover region, maybe between mid and tweeter, but I'm not 100% sure. Then if we go to ERDI, I'm gonna chalk this up to vertical, and hopefully I'll have that below this one to two kilohertz area. So more than likely, it's probably smooth through here horizontally. And then that means that you could EQ that down with success. You can EQ this area with pretty good success too, because this is flat right through here. Uh, pretty reasonably flat through here. Now this area would need some issues or would cause some issues when you're trying to EQ that uh, because it means that it's changing the radiation distinctly at about four kilohertz, probably some edge diffraction or something of that nature. Then we increase in directivity above 10 kilohertz. Okay, that's that's okay. Then if we go and look at the, well, let's look at this first. This base boost right here, no bueno. I do not like that. Some Now, if it weren't so steep, right? To me, this is a little bit more than what I call a mild Q bump. Uh, if you've ever built a subwoofer enclosure, you know stay away from high Q, right? And generally speaking, 0 0.707 is like the magic QTC number where that's kind of like the perfectly damped or critically damped point. Anything above that QTC uh, is gonna sound a bit boomy, resonant, those kind of things. And usually that's just from either the wrong woofer being used in the enclosure or the wrong sized enclosure being used for that woofer, which is kind of the same thing, but not necessarily. What that means is you're gonna have some boominess right in this area. Now it's interesting to think, would that be useful? If you have a dip right in this area from your room, maybe. But in my experience, when you're trying to fill those kind of things in uh, with extra power or with extra speaker, it usually just comes off as even more problematic. It just goes against the grain. And that's the best way I can put it. So there's the most useless statement I probably ever made, but hey, I'm full of them. Uh, but yeah, if this were smooth through here, right? Like if it tapered off through that mid range, it wouldn't be as big of an issue, but because it's so uh, just prominent right there all of a sudden, then yeah, that sounds boomy, resonant. And then it starts to roll off. I think the F3, did I note it down here? Yeah, F3 is 58 Hertz. Use a subwoofer. Let's see here, estimated in-room response. I'm willing to bet most of you think, oh, it looks good except for this, so everything else looks great. Nope, remember what I said, we want to slope. When it's flat like this, it's going to sound crazy bright, and that's exactly how these speakers sounded. Uh, again, we can equalize this. If we go back up to the ERDI above, then that kind of gives us an idea of what we can and cannot equalize, and we can equalize that. Now, take a shell filter, knock that down some, you're good. 
Let's keep going, horizontal radiation. Now I said that one to two kilohertz area, and yeah, this is one to two, and it's pretty even. So yeah, that issue that I noted in, let's see here, uh, this right there, or this right here, is most likely due to the vertical. So let's go see. Uh, vertical, there's a little bit of a dip right through there. So that's probably where that's coming from. Uh, and it's also pretty prominent right in this area. It's not as bad as I thought it would be, but really it's not that bad in the ERDI. Overall, the response, the horizontal radiation in this graphic, um, you know, it's not too bad. There's there's a suck out right through here. Not really sure. Again, it, maybe it could be diffraction. I would have to go dig a little bit deeper into the data to understand and find out for sure. But I just, I'm kind of torn on that. You know, is, is it a problem? You could probably equalize it up. I'd have to go back and look at the ERDI. Um, but I, the one thing that's interesting is look how narrow the sound field is until about 500 hertz. Uh, that's at about, I'm going to scope myself up in here, about plus or minus 30 degrees. Okay, so that's okay if you're sitting off axis to the side. You've got width out to about 30 degrees, and that's, that's okay. I mean, ideally it would be uniform and there would be no change as you go from the mid-range, especially with the lower mid-range to the upper mid-range, where this transition is five to 800 hertz, somewhere through here. Um, but that's okay. You could live with that, I think. Uh, let's go back and look at the vertical again. And then here, same kind of deal. Sit plus or minus 10 degrees of the speaker. I'm really surprised that it's quite that narrow because they have the vertical MTM. They must be using they're either using too low of a, of a crossover uh, point frequency or they're just using low order slopes. I didn't do near field measurements for this speaker to see because uh, it really doesn't matter. Really what matters is the end product. If I wanted to reverse engineer it, that would be a separate study altogether and not really a review. Uh, let's go look at the distortion. Very, very low again at 86 dB. Very, very low again at 96 dB until you get to about 100 hertz, then yeah, you start to see that you're rising up again. But still, this is pretty low. 96 dB, you're under 3% THD, and it's second order. So I'm okay with that, you know? I'm not, I don't know, it's not a big deal to me. I do find it interesting that this one stands out, this fifth order mode stands out at about three kilohertz. Interesting, come back to that one day. All right, compression, let's see, compression. Looks good to the mid-range, high frequency, there's some issue, low frequency, more of an issue. And this is really where I was like, wow, man, that kind of stinks. Because you could have equalized the speaker to do whatever you wanted. Um, distortion is very, very low, but the compression leaves a lot to be desired. I would have preferred that it wouldn't have started hitting this until it got to about 80 hertz. And it just starts in earlier. Now, you know, I'm harping on this. Is, is it something that you're going to hear? Verdict's out, right? I look at this as a telltale sign of a good speaker or good design. And when it starts doing or it starts exhibiting higher compression at a higher frequency like this, then I'm more apt to not let it uh, off the chain or cut it some slack. So, mm, eh, I don't know. Not a fan of that. Let's see here. Good sensitivity, but not as high as I'd hope given the number of drivers. Yeah, same thing. I was really just hoping for better sensitivity. I was hoping that it would match the towers. I mean, the towers are like 91, 92, 93, depending on what frequency. And this speaker is around 88 dB, 89 dB. So you're going to need at least 3 dB more in terms of output for the center channel, which is just odd to me. I don't know why they didn't do a better job of matching sensitivities for this speaker. Very forward and very bright sound out of the box. EQ will help the speaker. Uh, two to three is going to be hard to completely resolve especially if you have to sit 10 degrees above or below your ear, which is kind of what I was saying above. That's That sweet spot is right between like zero and five degrees, which really means that if you're setting this up as a center channel in front of your screen, below your screen, really, um, you're going to need to angle it. And the cool thing about this speaker, though, is that it does come with some really cool angling brackets. So you could do that. And it wouldn't really be an issue. Use a high-pass crossover above 80 hertz to ensure solid dynamic range. All right, that's it. Let me close this out. So that, that's it really for this review. You know, I kind of just wanted to go over some, some notes here. So I'm gonna jump into the chat really fast and see if anybody's got any comments or questions about this particular speaker. Okay. 
I do. I see all of you, by the way, making some funny jokes, and I appreciate them. How well do these work with Oro? No idea, man. Uh, I don't evaluate speakers on a or strictly Oro basis, nor strictly Atmos basis. I evaluate speakers based on their performance in terms of frequency response, radiation pattern, and then I kind of say, okay, well, how is this most likely to be used? This speaker. If somebody said I need a full range two channel system, I would not recommend this speaker. Number one, because of, well, for a number of reasons, but one reason being that it rolls off, it's sealed, it rolls off at around 80 hertz. So it needs a subwoofer, right? And I'm not going to dock a speaker that's been designed to work with a subwoofer for not playing down into 50, 30, 40 hertz, something like that. It doesn't make any sense to do that. That's just, uh, that's short sighted at best. But again, yeah, I don't really have any comments about how this would or would not work with Oro. They're huge, though. That's one thing. I mean, I don't know how you're going to put them up. I, you surely you're not talking about like ceiling speakers. I would, I would assume not. Um, you know, I wouldn't use them. I wouldn't recommend the speaker without equalization. I'll just leave it at that. Stormy Young, $10 super chat to help keep the reviews going. Man, I appreciate that. I really do, honest to goodness. Um, and what I'm going to use that for is a new oven because here's a funny story that some of you might pre appreciate. Some of you may get scarred. Some of you may be triggered by this. I was about to heat up some pizzas the other night, turned the oven on, walked out to the garage to carry something out there, heard what I thought was my dog screaming. I was like, gosh, she's a German Shepherd. And she, when you put her in a crate, she goes, like really high pitched. Turned out to be my wife screaming. Uh, I basically set the oven on fire. And luckily, she saw it and was able to put that fire out. And yeah, that's a huge fail on my part. I know some of you are like, oh, you're an idiot. Well, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Crap happens. Uh, and luckily, it wasn't worse than it was. So I'm going to have to buy a new oven. Yay. But yeah, so I appreciate that because that's probably going to go help go toward that, if I'm being honest. Okay, I considered Atlantic Technology before buying CAF Q550. I was going to buy AT, THX, uh, Slick Bookshelves, and Center. Okay, I'm curious which one you went with. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering how did the oven almost get set on fire, well, we store stuff, not store stuff, but like we have our our trays and racks and stuff like that in there. Well, we have one of those silicone pads, and I didn't realize it was at the very top of the oven, and it apparently was touching the heater elements at the top, and I had no idea. I'd actually opened the oven, taken the stuff out of the middle tray, set it off to the side, and that's what happened. It actually touched it and caught on fire, and my wife said that the flames were coming out of the oven. Can you guys imagine? She was scarred for life. Um, by the way, if anybody's got a couch, I may need to sleep on it for a while. The same. I am surprised. I was expecting a bit better performance from these. You know, honestly, I was too. Luckily, you can EQ a lot of this stuff. And when you're talking about a home theater type speaker, you're going to be using EQ. I don't know anybody that, that has a home theater system that doesn't have equalization. Uh, so you can equalize the speaker. Now, here's that thing. Do you want a speaker that you have to equalize? I don't know. And if I'm being honest, I really didn't dig too much further into the radiation. Not In an ideal world, what I would have done is I would have taken the data. I would have said, okay, let me add some equalization tweaks to it. And then I'm going to rerun it again fully and see what it does. And I actually have done that with a couple other speakers because I'm, I'm just curious what, what the results turn out to be. Uh, but I didn't do it with this speaker just because I was like, well, that kind of stinks. But it, it confirmed what I heard. And then I did carry them back upstairs. I listened to them and applied some equalization there just to kind of sanity check some stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you on this statement. Um, do I have any recommendations for center channels in the five to 600 price range? Yeah, the mono price, THX 365C, I think the one that I just reviewed a couple weeks ago. That's a good one. Um, Kef has some good stuff. The Kefs need EQ. 
but the Kefs take well to EQ. So the Kefs aren't as linear as I wanted to be out of the box, but again, home theater, you're using EQ, use EQ, smooth it out, and you'll be happy. The one thing that you can't EQ though is directivity, right? And what I mean, when I say that, I mean that if you want a wide soundstage, you want a wide radiation pattern from a speaker, uh, you can't make a speaker have a wide radiation pattern if it doesn't already have that. Uh, sometimes that's controlled by crossovers, but even if you had the perfect crossovers, if you have a narrowing tweeter, then you can't make it extend wider. Uh, so there's just certain limits that you can't get past physically with the performance of a speaker, and directivity is one of them. Uh, good review. Surprising results for the cost. I'll sit with DevTex. Get those in one day. AA. Hey, man, you always have cool, cool vibes to send. So I want to thank you, first of all, for that. And uh, yeah, one day I would like to test some DevTex stuff. What do you think made the 4367s more palpable than other speakers with similar? I got to be honest with you, man. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I would consider, I don't know if I've ever used the word palpable in a review. Uh, what I just liked about the 4367s is that I would consider them smooth. And when I say smooth, I attributed that to the drop high frequency, like above 8K, if I recall correctly, and slightly narrowing radiation. Because what happens most of the time is you get a frequency response that is flat on axis. And if it's narrowing in radiation, then it'll start to slope off in the room. But if it's flat in directivity or radiation, it's, it's basically staying the exact same all the way through the high frequencies in terms of you know plus or minus 30 degrees or plus or minus 50 degrees or whatever then it's often going to come across as more bright more treble heavy because you have just as much sidewall reflections of the tweeter and the high frequencies as you do the mids um and i tend to not prefer that right so i don't know necessarily other than what I just said about the 4367 that I liked, but that's one thing that I definitely remember liking about that speaker. AV Nut, cheers to you with my water, my holiday cup here. <laughs> Thank you, man, I appreciate that. I wonder how these would go on your desktop. I don't know, with a big lift, a big winch. <laughs> I'm married. The couch is needed. No doubt, man. No doubt. Um, any more in-wall speakers on the horizon for upcoming? Yes, there are quite a few. And I don't want to say anything just yet. Uh, but yes, I've already got two in the garage right now. I'm working on the um, Monoprice Encore uh, speakers, like the full kit, because I'm going to review those as the tower, bookshelf, and center. And I'm working on finishing that up right now. So I've got some other stuff coming along first, then those, and then I'm going to start measuring the in-wall speakers. And then, well, maybe not then, but also around the same time, some drive units, mainly Purify stuff. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Good count sound character though, not to me. It depends, man. I'm trying to to slow down, so it just depends. Turnaround time for me could be anywhere from a month to well, I don't know three months at at this rate. Jesus. Um, did AT send you the big sub? Would you review it? They did not. Would I? I guess. Yeah. If, if time is right, you know, you guys may have seen that I posted a video like a month ago or maybe posted a, something somewhat recently. It kind of said I was going to start scaling back. So what I'm trying to do is just do less reviews, um, do one a week instead of two or three. Cause that's just crazy. I just don't have time for that. So, uh, we'll see, you know, I do have a mono price subwoofer. For in wall is NFS stated sensitivity anechoic or including so it's inherent. So the baffle step or not baffle step, the baffle is part of the speaker at that point. Uh, so you you don't separate the two. So it's inherent. It's part of the uh, in wall measurement. 
The Hiko Aurora Heko, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Possibly. Possibly. So. And let's see. I think that's it. I think I've got through everything. Uh, I'll give it like maybe one more minute. And just to make sure that nobody's got any other questions about these AT speakers. And then I'm going to bail out and go try to find a movie to watch for my kiddo. Also, I think my AVR took a crap on me today. We were playing Nintendo earlier. She just coughed again. Uh, we were playing Nintendo earlier, and then I went back upstairs to do some listening for a different speaker, and my projector wouldn't turn on. And long story short, I narrowed it down to the AVR. So I'm hoping that it's just a finicky thing, because I really don't want to have to replace that right now. Like, a man, when it rains, it pours. But, you know, I don't know. That's just life sometimes. Okay. All right. Well, nobody's having any more of the questions about this speaker, so I will bid you all adieu. Hope you all have a great Saturday. I appreciate you watching. If you have any other questions, make sure to leave it uh, in the comments section below. And if you're new to this channel and you haven't already, probably haven't made it this far, but please consider subscribing, like, all that cool stuff that would help. Thoughts on the subjective impressions of them versus John Atkinson, who liked them a lot. I don't, which speaker are you talking about? Talking about the 4367 or the ATs? And the fact that I'm asking means that I don't have any thoughts on it. If you're talking about the 4367, I think it was somebody else who measured them or reviewed them and then John measured them. But anyway. Okay, yeah, just leave that comment below. I got to split. Uh, again, you all take care. Have a great night.